You're listening to the Mother to Baby Podcast, medications and more during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Ask the experts with your host, genetic counselor and mom of four, Chris Stallman. Welcome to another episode of the Mother to Baby Podcast. My name is Chris Stallman and I am a mom of four, a genetic counselor, and a teratogen information specialist. So what I do is I talk to people, so patients and providers, about exposures before pregnancy, during pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and in cases of adoption. And an exposure can be anything. So it could be a medication, it could be something going on at your workplace, or it could be a supplement. And actually, that's going to be the focus of today's episode. We are going to talk about one supplement in particular that has been in the news recently. And to talk with us, we have a very special guest. Laura Morehouse has served as the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center, which is what we call our Poison Center here in Tucson, since 2016. She provides community education and outreach on poison prevention, medication management, and much more. She's received her MPH from the University of Arizona with a concentration in health behavior and health promotion. She's a certified health education specialist and an absolute delight to work with. Laura, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. We're really happy to have you on. This is going to be a little bit different than what the podcast usually covers. Of course, we're going to go over pregnancy and breastfeeding information, but we're really happy to have you on to talk about something that other people may not think about as often, which is the poison centers. So Laura, can you tell our audience exactly what is a poison center? And that's a great question, Chris. When I go out and I do my community events, a lot of times I get the question, what is a poison center? (laughs) So our poison center and all poison centers are a medical service, so we are medical, that provides fast, free, expert treatment advice and help for poisonings over the phone. So unlike 911, we are phone-based and we help people through a phone call. Now, there are actually over 55 poison control centers in the U.S. So not every state has a poison center, but everyone has access to one. We're staffed by healthcare experts, so we have pharmacists, nurses, doctors, and much more. And of course, at our poison center, we're lucky enough to work with mother to baby (laughs) and you to provide that information for pregnant and breastfeeding women as well. Anyone can call a poison center. We're not just for kids. We help people of all ages. That's not to say that we get calls about kids the most, but we help everyone from parents to teenagers to older adults. Calling a poison center gets you to an expert who can help you with your exact situation. So no robots on the line here. And we're open 24-7, which means you can call at any time. And I always get the question, well, what do you get called about? And we get called about anything and everything <laughs> from prescription medicine to poisonous plants to sloth bites at a petting zoo. Yes, that was a call we had before. <laughs> I know. To bites and things from venomous creatures, especially here in Arizona, which is where we're based. Um, and the big thing is that you can call in case of an emergency or even if you just have a question. And a lot of calls that we would get are just questions from concerned parents and other people. And I think that's really cool, you know, that it is open to everybody. So not just parents, as you said, but, you know, general public also providers, you know, especially if there's something tricky where they they want that other expert opinion to come in on it. And I do appreciate it's just the same as it is at mother to baby. Um, There is no, quote, dumb question. You know, every every question is valid and welcome. It sounds like at the Poison Center, certainly at mother to baby also. Oh, absolutely. There are no dumb questions. Every question is a good and valid question. So even if you feel silly when you're calling, just know that we've heard it all. And so (laughs) we just want to be able to help. That is a good reminder. That is a very good reminder. (laughs) So what I wanted to talk about today in particular is a supplement called melatonin. So before we go any further, can you tell us a little bit about melatonin? 
Yes, of course. And this is a very timely topic because we are getting a lot of calls about melatonin recently. So melatonin is a hormone and it actually occurs naturally in the body. So your body produces it and its main function is to help control the body's sleep cycle. So it helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. The big thing is, is that it's also a manufactured supplement. And that means that you can take it over the counter as a sleep aid. Over the counter means that you can buy it without prescription. So if you want to go to your local grocery store or drugstore, you can buy it without a need to talk to a doctor. It's really widely available, and there's a lot of different types that you can buy. It could be a tablet or pill. It could come as a liquid formation, or it could be a gummy form. And, of course, those gummy forms are what we get the most calls about, especially when it comes to kids. And we're seeing a big spike in sales of over-the-counter melatonin. Um, I think it's been about 150% increase over the past four years. So it's, it's huge right now. And something else to add about supplements in general in the United States. So the FDA, which is the United States Food and Drug Administration, that's the agency that approves prescription medications before they become available to the public. However, supplements are not regulated in the same way that prescription drugs are. So for example, the FDA doesn't test or approve supplements before they're sold. They The supplements don't need to show any safety data or any efficacy. So like any information that they work for what they say they're going to work for. And in some cases, the ingredients and dose on the label may be different from what's actually in the product. And so I know that people, you know, inside and outside of pregnancy and breastfeeding take supplements. I take supplements, for example. Um, But in general, It's not suggested to use supplements in pregnancy or breastfeeding unless you're having that discussion with your healthcare provider just in case, you know, there's something extra that they want you to know about the supplement that you're taking. And I'd like to add that since melatonin is a supplement, like you said, and subject to less regulatory oversight, recent studies have come out showing that the actual content of melatonin can be many times higher than what's listed on the label. Mm. And so as adult use especially increases, we are seeing people take very high doses of melatonin, which can be concerning. So why is melatonin in the news right now? Well, you might have seen a couple of weeks ago a CDC study was published, and the CDC study was looking at melatonin in pediatric patients, so our children under the age of 19. And they looked at it over the past 10 years, and what they found was skyrocketing numbers of ingestions from 2012 to 2021. So some of the information from that study was that the annual number of pediatric ingestions, so the number of our children who were ingesting or eating or swallowing in some way melatonin, increased 530%. And there were over 260,000 ingestions reported to poison centers nationwide. Now, over that 10-year period, more than 4,000 kids were actually hospitalized for melatonin ingestion. And a lot of that, they think, is attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. So children spent more time at home. Of course, a lot of schools were closed. There was a lot of online learning. And that means that there's increased access inside the house. If you take melatonin, maybe it's not stored properly inside the house. Kids are there longer for more hours of the day. They can get into it. And then because so many people were experiencing sleep disturbances, I know I certainly was having trouble sleeping through part of it, more people were buying melatonin and it was increasing the availability inside the house. And so you kind of combine all those factors and we're seeing recently that a lot of pediatric ingestions are happening in the past couple years, but it's been a trend over a long period of time. How interesting, Um, linking back that information about COVID-19. Yes, I can absolutely say Mm -hmm. that I personally have had more than a few sleepless nights. Um, And my older children, especially, I know also um, had some sleep disturbances for some reason or another. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. So in terms of ingestion, so that taking and swallowing, I know that, you know, if you give it to a child, especially, you know, if you've had that discussion with your healthcare provider, that's one thing. But if kids are accessing it themselves, then that's something different. So in general, what are some tips for avoiding these types of ingestions, the type that are not intended? 
Right. And that is a huge part of what I actually teach parents and other caregivers is how do we avoid unintentional ingestion? So kids accidentally gain into stuff. And for the purposes of this, we'll consider melatonin to be, you know, along with the medicines and other supplements, to be something we don't want kids to get into unless it's given to them by the parent or caregiver. So first and foremost, store all of your medicines, supplements included, vitamins included, anything you might use like that, out of sight and reach of kids. So what we recommend is that you try and pick a storage place that children cannot reach or see. So think of a lock space above kitchen counter height. Now, don't underestimate your children. A lot of young children, especially toddlers, can climb and will climb. So make sure it's locked as well. And then we tell people to put medicine away every single time. So we never want to leave a medicine on a kitchen counter or near the bedside. Make sure to keep medicine in its original container so you're able to see the drug label. And make sure the safety cap is locked each time. Remember that child resistant does not mean child proof. With enough time, a child can open pretty much anything. And then for our adults, we want to make sure that you read the drug label carefully and don't take more than the recommended amount. And those are really helpful tips to remember. I know, you know, I give my children their prescribed medications, but you're absolutely right. My two and a half year old, if I leave that on the counter and it's a high counter, she's got a chair, she's there trying to spill it out or whatever she is. They're quick. You know, I, I think I underestimated my children um, thinking, yeah, I could just leave it up here all the way in the back or on top of the fridge. Nope. They're, they're going to be up there. So, and then it's usually a big mess for me. So um, it's definitely a good reminder. And I know that for myself, um, and of course, for other people, medication mix ups can happen for whatever reason. So what I wanted to address is sometimes we get questions about, okay, well, I accidentally took a dose of melatonin while I'm pregnant or breastfeeding, or this is something I want to take while I'm pregnant or breastfeeding. You know, what is the information out there? And what we tell people about pregnancy is that every pregnancy starts out with a three to 5% chance of having a birth defect. They call that the background risk. And what we at Mother to Baby talk about is, is there something so like an exposure that's going to increase the chance for birth defects above that background risk. And when it comes to melatonin, as you said, you know, it's typically present in the body, your body makes it. In pregnancy, the amount your body makes is going to increase later in pregnancy. We don't have information about the possible effects of melatonin supplements during pregnancy. Based on what we do know, there does not seem to be an increased chance for birth defects. But some researchers have a concern that melatonin supplements can interfere with the way the developing baby later establishes their own sleep cycles after they're born. So not something that's proven, but something that researchers have thought about and have concerns about. And so because of that, and really because there's very little information on the use of supplements in pregnancy, there are some health organizations that have recommended, you know, not using melatonin in pregnancy, or certainly talking with your healthcare provider before you start taking that type of supplements. In terms of breastfeeding, melatonin is also a natural part of breast milk. The concentrations are higher during nighttime. And again, use of that supplemental form of melatonin is limited. In some cases, they can give melatonin directly to babies and negative side effects have not been reported. So there's sort of two schools of thinking here. So some people say maybe short-term use in breastfeeding is acceptable. Others say, you know, perhaps you want to avoid because of lack of data. But in general, before starting, stopping, or changing any medications or supplements, we're going to suggest that people talk with their healthcare providers, and that way they can guide you on what's best for you and how they want to treat any issues that you're having with sleep. So, Laura, let's say that someone in pregnancy and breastfeeding outside of pregnancy or breastfeeding has one of these accidental or in some cases intentional ingestions of melatonin, what should they do? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I just want to talk about melatonin um, and just the safety for people outside of pregnancy and breastfeeding. In general, melatonin is considered to be relatively safe 
and most ingestions have no actual clinical effects, so no symptoms or side effects. And those that do, the most common by far is drowsiness, so feeling very sleepy. We also see reduced coordination. Some people might throw up or vomit, sometimes stomach pain, and a faster heartbeat. Now, there are a couple of reports of children needing to be intubated, which means they go to the hospital and they are going to be helped through breathing, or dying from melatonin. But it's important to note that in these cases, melatonin was present but wasn't the sole cause of death. So we're not as worried about death. Out of the hundreds of thousands of exposures of melatonin reported to poison centers, we don't really see anything life-threatening when it's melatonin by itself. So that's good news. Now, if there is an accidental ingestion or medicine mix-up, and those happen, and like you said, life happens, the easiest and safest thing to do is to call your local poison center at 1-800-222-1222. We recommend you call right away if you think someone may have gone into melatonin, even if you're not completely sure. While most of those melatonin ingestions, like I said, they typically turn out fine, each one is a case-by-case basis. Mm -hmm. Now, when you call, a specialist is going to gather some information to understand exactly what happened and how your child or yourself is currently doing. And then, depending on what's going on, we're either going to offer to call you back and check up with you in like an hour or so, or we'll actually tell you if a hospital visit is needed. But in general, the best thing to do is call us just in case. That's what we're here for. And I think that's really helpful. And I've done that myself where, you know, there was something that I wasn't too sure about. And I called and said, Hey, listen, do we need to head out to the emergency department? Do we need to go to urgent care? And that was especially helpful. And I would imagine continues to be especially helpful during COVID, you know, because if I'm worried about, you know, X, Y, or Z, but then, you know, also, is there a lot of COVID cases near me? Is the hospital full? Will we be waiting a long time? And maybe we don't have to. I think it's a great idea that you can call into your local poison center and they can give you some information on what the next steps could be. Absolutely. And a really cool thing that we do besides that follow-up system, which a lot of our callers really appreciate, is that we can call 911 on your behalf if it's requested. So if you have to get to the emergency room right away, we can assist with that process, which I think is a nice perk as well. And I think it's really helpful because in an emergency, you know, sometimes at least I have had trouble thinking clearly and having someone else who is calm and collected on the other side who could make that call if need be is very helpful. Oh, yes, definitely. And all of our staff, very experienced. And like you said, cool, calm, and collected is pretty much how I would describe each and every one of them. And it's such a great resource to have. So, Laura, um, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for this information. But before you go, is there a final thought that you would like to leave our audience with? I actually have three final thoughts for you. <laughs> Very so prepared. Now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So as just a little recap, melatonin has surged in popularity among adults, and we've seen that ingestions have also increased in children. So the best way to prevent any sort of accident inside the home, store all those medicines and supplements up and away, out of sight and reach. And second, program the poison help number into your cell phone so that you have it when you need it. And again, that number is 1-800-222-1222. Excellent. Such a great reminder. And again, thank you for being on the show and stay safe out there. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for being part of this most recent Mother to Baby podcast. We are always looking for your feedback, input, and ideas. So if you have an idea for the show, if you want to be on the show, feel free to email us at contact us at mother to baby dot org. And be sure to subscribe to the Mother to Baby podcast. That way you never miss a new episode. And you could also go back and listen to previous episodes as well. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or however you listen to podcasts. And of course, Mother to Baby is here to answer your questions. So you can reach us by phone at 866-626-6847, by text at 855-999-3525, 
You can visit our website at mothertobaby.org. And from our website, you can use our chat feature where you can chat with a teratogen information specialist online. You can also access our baby blogs. Our podcast episodes are there as well and our fact sheets. So we have over 250 fact sheets written for patients. They are free. We have them in English and Spanish, and they cover a range of topics, including supplements, vaccines, medications, and more. So until next time, thank you for being part of the Mother to Baby podcast. And remember, Mother to Baby is here for you. Take care. Mother to Baby is a service of the nonprofit organization of Teratology Information Specialists and supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's made possible through generous donations from listeners like you. To learn more about Mother to Baby, please visit mothertobaby.org.